We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from local Windsor gamer, game designer, and tabletop bellhop Patreon, Roger Malosh. Yeah, you too could be one of our Patreon patrons. Just head over to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and check out the various reward levels. Now, I personally think the hotel guest level is the sweet spot, but we appreciate any and all support we receive. Now, Roger is well known around these parts for sending us nice, long, detailed questions. So what do we have from Roger this week, Sean? Well, Roger writes, hey, Mo and Sean, I played pret a porter the other day with my wife. It's very well put together and looks great on the table. The complex mechanics were very intuitive and made perfect sense as we played the game. The art, however, was a little over the top. It took some effort to get past the graphics to concentrate on the important bits. I could have used a volume knob on the player board to turn the graphics down a bit so they weren't so <laughs> distracting. Have you ever run into this problem? When does the art in a game go beyond the point of immersion to become a distraction? When is a game too pretty? Well, first off, thanks for the question and your patronage, Roger. Great question, as always. Uh, so this one is uh, more so than many of the topics we talk about. Very subjective. I think different people are going to tolerate different levels of busyness, art, and thematic depth to their games versus some other people that want things to be as abstract and easy to see as possible. So this is going to be our reviews on this subject, obviously, which are going to be different for everyone involved. For example, I'm going to call it out right away. I did find Preta Porter a little bright, but it's an Ian O'Toole design, a graphic design on an, on uh, and, and I actually appreciate a lot of the extra information that's there that stops me from having to look up stuff in the book. But that said, there is one column on the right hand side of the board that shows you the various phases of the game. And while I understand why it's there and the information it provides, I find that almost unreadable. It's just a bunch of icons that blur together that don't, to me, relate well to the actual game phases. But as for brightness and flashiness, it kind of fits. It's a game about fashion, so I understand the board being very flashy. I just wish the iconography was a little more clear. Fair enough. Well, I think our first answer, the easy answer, the, the let's go home now, we're done, is when it interferes with gameplay, then it's a problem. Like, really, that's that's the important thing is, yes, I love theming games and I love thematic games. Listen to our episode about theming games. And sometimes the theme can go too far. Uh, same is true of artwork. And I totally adore the, when, when appropriate artworks in a game. But that is up until that makes the game harder to play in some way. Whether that's I can't find the information I need or it means they're showcasing the artwork so the iconography is made smaller so you can really show off that space station and the awesome artwork the artist supplied of that space station. Meanwhile, the important information isn't even that it's a space station, it's that it's a 3-2 card that provides this one resource. And that is when it becomes a problem. And it goes into something and um, I first heard on the Ludology podcast and I apologize for not knowing the name of the person who put forth this this the game design theory of the zones of play and we've talked about this on the show before where it's the the first zone is is cards in your hand going to like the sixth zone is the box and depending on where you want to find information you want it to be in the appropriate zone and that i think plays a big part in this Whereas if I have a card or something in my hand, you can fill that with all kinds of pretty stuff because I can easily see everything on the card. Whereas if I have a card I have to put down on a table, that needs to be less busy. There has to be less artwork. That's where the iconography and the important information really needs to stick out. And no, I don't remember if on the table is like round three because there's on the table and on the board are different. So like on the table in front of you versus in some other player's playing area, I think is number five. But I think everyone gets the gist of what I'm trying to say. So I'm going to, we, we did cover this once before, but I'm going to do a quick summary of Scott Rogers Thank zones you. of play, which zone one is the player's dominant hand zone yeah. two being the player's off hand zone. Three is your personal tableau zone. Four is the board or shared space zone. Five is the sideboard and zone six is the rule book. 
Oh, that's weird. It doesn't have the box. Okay. So whoever uh, well, there I, is, it's, it's six or seven. Seven would be the box. It's, uh, okay. it's kind of a, a an extra. Because I will admit, I have played a game that made me look up something in the box part way through, and I just thought that was terrible. <laughs> where you have to like go get cards from the box and add them to the game in the middle of what you were playing. Um, not going to call out what game it is, I guess. Though in this particular episode, maybe it would fit. Um, I think Sean was playing the game with me at the time, or Tori and Cat were. But it is a it was a dungeon crawling game where it gives you all the components to do what you're going to do, and then you open a door and it surprises you. And I'm like, okay, I get it. Like I, I like that you're giving me the surprise, but now I have to go find the game box and all the stuff again, which stank. I think one thing, and we've already we called it out already, and I think and Ryan's talking about it a little bit in the chat room is board game art, and I think one of the things that may make that a big problem, especially with newer publishers or self publishing, is art is expensive. Mm -hmm. Good art is even more expensive, and it can be a struggle to decide to sort of rein back this art that you've spent so much money on and are really proud of, even, you know, maybe you've done it yourself and you're really proud of the artwork for this game. It can be hard to think and stop and take that art and, and rein it back just a little bit yeah. in order to make the iconography or the rules or the text or whatever more visible. And that's mm -hmm. an easy mistake to make for, uh, you know, less experienced game designers. And so for a lot of the Kickstarters and self-publishers, that's where you can sort of see that particular problem coming. Art is expensive. Show off the art you paid a lot of money for. That and some people are really hyped about the theme of their game. They're really into the fact that it's a cyberpunk horror Western, and they really want to show off this awesome world they've created. And that's great as long as it doesn't, again, impact the gameplay. Now, showing off a world generally works better in an RPG where you can also produce say, an art book. There's a good example I hadn't thought of. So an example of this is Tales from the Loop having such fantastic artwork. Well, if you get the board game, if you back the Kickstarter, you could have got an art book. There's a great way to not have the problem Sean's talking about, where you can provide the game that's playable um, to varying degrees. You can check out a review why it might not be as playable as they'd hope, but it's not because of the graphic design um, and a, and being able to showcase that art. Now, it makes sense in this case because it's based on Stein and Stylin Hogg's art, which is it was an art book that inspired the game. But it'd be nice to see other games provide you with that artwork in a way that's not necessarily in the game. Like if you've got your new dungeon crawler, I'm thinking a Hellbringer off the top of my head. So a dungeon crawler, we did a Diablo style game that had pretty good artwork on the cards. If they're that proud of that artwork, give me a, a Hellbringer source book, like a, a, a background book or art book that shows off all those cards without the text and icons on top. Another example would be not necessarily thinking through. So you've got your game board, and you've got fantastic art. I'm going to go with a game that Mo just recently picked up. Close Encounters of the Third Kind, mm. which is a giant board which has the icon, the, the iconic image from the movie. It's, it's yep. an unmistakable image. Anyone, you know, from like, you know, probably about 18 years or older would see this image and immediately recognize it. But that's the entire board when it's actually a square, a bunch of squares of numbers. Um, which become harder to read because this I iconic photo is taking up over the whole board. Yeah, and in yeah. that case, the, the board, like, you're searching areas, but the picture is the UFO in the mountain. Like, yeah. it it has it, it's a it's a like hide and seek game it, it makes no sense yeah it's, it's so a, it's yeah really that's, that's another one like, like actually make sure the art makes sense with the topic like of the game i i'm i'm, I'm not going to come up with a game off the top of my head i think that does this but there is definitely games i've played where i'm like well wait a minute this isn't at all what i expected from this game based on the description there are a number of things that can make the art too much um like we're talking about big pretty pictures right that take up more of a card or more of the board than they should but there's more to it than that you can also have clashing artwork if you have too many different art styles that can bring people out of a game now an example of this that many people bring up is terraforming mars terraforming mars is a mix of stock photos digital artwork and hand-drawn stuff that they must have paid for. Like, I don't I don't even know where they got it from. Now, I'll admit it, it doesn't bother me much. I am not one of those people that hates on the art in Terraforming Mars. But if that's what you're paying attention to on the cards, it's just, there's no unified feel. 
So by having a diverse amount of art that doesn't match can bring people out of the game. Can get into some garish design. Uh, I, I think back to the days when, uh, you know, home publishing became a thing when the Macintosh was first new and everyone all of a sudden had access to be able to print their own self-published documents with 6,000 fonts on them and mm. all the clip art you could imagine. And it was painful on the eyes and people realized all of a sudden that, oh, wait, this whole this whole layout and, and, and design thing is actually a little harder than we thought. Uh, yep. You can't just slap 17 fonts onto a page and make it, uh, make it happy to read. Now, another one is brightness and contrast. We've seen this um, too low and I've seen it too high. It seems very common in, again, independent Kickstarter games, newly produced games, not by well-known publishers, that I think things look great on the screen. But then when they print it, it's way too dark. And I think that's just a difference that people have to account for. And I don't know if they're not getting proofs or why, why this ends up in the end product. But we have played a number of games where when the card art shows up, it's too dark. Now, this could be the like art as in it looks pretty art, but also like the design. I've also played way too many dungeon crawl games where I can't see the grid on the map. And that's an important thing that needs to be there during play. Or the grid on the map is there, but it's the same color as the artwork. Like there's just, you need to have that contrast and to make what's important in the game stick out. And then how many other games have you played? Hex games, war games, old school war games, hex encounter war games, where you're like, okay, they tried to go with a realistic map. And there's a reason most war games are just like colored squares, because when they try to make it nice, it's like, okay, there's a bit of forest showing into this hex. Does that mean that's a forest hex? Is that partially forested? What percentage of a hex has to be covered by trees for it to count as forested? Now that interferes with gameplay, not because it's too busy or too bright or you don't like the look of it, but because it's providing in clear information. Yeah. One Now one real big problem, and Brian, we, Mo mentioned it, and again, Ryan's bringing it up in the chat, is the difference between screen and print. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the huge problems, and I know this as a photographer, uh, one of the number one problems in displays, both in your phones, your home computers, is your monitors, your, what you're viewing things on, are almost guaranteed to be too bright. Um, and this is, this, is, this is just a problem. It's, it's a, the, a lot of manufacturers have decided that, that bright is better, it punches through more, so they actually up their brightness and some of the, the, the modes you can go into punch up brightness more. But mm -hmm. if you actually calibrate, you know, get a proper device and calibrate your screens, everything gets a whole lot <laughs> duller, essentially. <laughs> um, and then another fa fantastic feature of you know, you know, Photoshop and Lightroom is the ability to uh, give it a, a concept. So I can say, oh, I'm going to be printing on this kind of paper. And, it, mm. and uh, on a calibrated screen, it will show me the difference between what I'm seeing on my monitor and what it's going to look like when it prints. Right. Again, you can't take that perfectly, but on a calibrated screen, you can get pretty accurate. But there aren't that many people out there these days who are calibrating their monitors. Uh, mm -hmm. And it gets even worse when you get into mobile devices because a lot of them have dynamic color spaces where they are actually punching up colors Mm -hmm. deliberately using AI on the fly to make photos look better when I in, in quotes, um, in loud quotes, uh, just because, you know, they want to show off their devices better and th that punchy photo makes their yep. device look better. And Dana just brought up something that's come up in the chat that's affected our blog posts and even the pictures in our reviews is the tilt on a laptop in particular, your tilt of your monitor completely changes the brightness mm -hmm. and she sat down done a ton of work on photo editing on photos she took with her good professional camera but had the laptop at an angle where it looked great and then we go to use it on the blog and she sends it to me and i'm like whoa this is super dark or oh my god that's so washed out it just it's it's one of those things like uh, WYSIWYG. what you see is what you get is never actually true on a computer as far as i can tell yeah no again I, and i mean 
and and Ryan brings up uh, you know photo accurate monitors. Should you can get you can spend twelve thousand dollars for uh, you know a full full gamut monitor, but even mm-hmm. without that, you can still calibrate and get things really close. Again, this is on a uh, on a on a computer monitor, not a laptop, because unfortunately on a laptop you can calibrate it, but again that viewing angle makes such yeah, a huge difference angle. that even if it's calibrated, if you tip it back too far or too or close too far, it is uh, it is a struggle. Now, other things that we can do to make things more clear, uh, contrast, um, repetition is something else that's important. So if you have, say, I don't, that trick taking game works, but it's too easy, but like a suit, make all the cards in the same suit look similar. Well, it's awesome that you have all these awesome different character arts for each of your one through 10 aces and they all look amazing. Make them at least look like aces instead of having to rely on people looking at the iconography. Now throw that into a board game. If we're looking at something where you can build five different types of buildings and commercial buildings are are one thing and, and residential buildings are another, make the commercial buildings all green. Make the residential buildings all red or something similar to that make it so that things that look similar are similar or grouped together in the game yeah exactly similar with similar and different different from others uh is all it's it's similar to contrast but in in a graphical format rather than an actual uh level thing you want to make sure that at a glance that the things that need to be different in a game are easily yes. seen as different. You don't want to force your players to be staring and looking and, you know, poking around and trying to figure out, uh, you know, what's what in their hand or on their player boards or on the board. Uh, make it easy for your players to play your game and they'll play it more. And and honestly, I've definitely seen this where it's too busy. Like there's just too many different things that that look like they're unrelated that are, or the opposite's also true. Like Sean kind of mentioned a bit there, but also make the things that are different from each other look different. So the things that should be the same should look the same. Things that are different. You don't want someone, I don't know, mixing up a, a mode of transportation from one of your buildings. And no, obviously, I have no specific game in mind when I'm writing these examples. I, you know, and, and I'm actually going to call out a specific game here because we didn't okay. put it on our list uh, later and we could have. Uh, and that's Dolce. Uh, one of the yep. things that Dolce did was the the icons for the type of product that was needed for each candy shop was a little on the small side. And it became really difficult to understand at a glance what kind you needed, but also how much of that you need. So there were two pieces of information being relayed from each little graphic, and they Mm -hmm. were so small that neither piece of information came through clearly. Yeah. And, And that was just a failing of the graphic design in that game. Other things that, can make it too much or or what we can do to make things clear we're going to group things together um the busyness like you have to people's eyes I, the, the big thing i'm thinking is rule books here white space is important that's not just true for rule book reading you have to give spots for the eyes to relax or the and, and group things into areas if you cover every square inch of your board with something it's just going to be overwhelming and 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 too much to see the same goes for cards in your hand player boards the the player mat or whatever the, the cover of your rule book or sorry the cover of your box can even be a problem with this if you cover every square inch with artwork the eyes don't know where to focus yeah there's there's a, a lot of theories uh again because photography is something i know about how to draw the eye to places and how mm-hmm. to how to use the the shapes and and directions and lines in your images to move the eye and if you just pack it full of stuff your eye doesn't stop moving you, yeah you, you, you they're looking everywhere but if you're looking everywhere you're not taking in anything um so so give the eye somewhere to go and then somewhere to go next uh don't make the eyes just constantly be sweeping around trying to figure out where they're supposed to be and then follow the the regional standards like here in north america and in many parts of the world we read left to right top to bottom don't design your board so that phase one is in the bottom right and phase 10 is in the top left that's just going to mess people up they expect to follow either perfectly clockwise in a spiral or they want to go left to right top to bottom 
But if you're making it for a different market, that's not necessarily yes, going to be the that's... same everywhere. Uh, if, if you're importing your, your game from uh, something that was made in the Japanese market, you are going to have a different pattern than left yes. to right, top to bottom. Now, one of the things I recommend is tie that to your theme if you are going to do that. But that gets into thematic games and integrating your theme appropriately. Now, this one's interesting. So we have the benefit of having a long term fan who has um, vision issues in our chat room right now. So Red Meeple Ryan just pointed out that one of the things you definitely need when using Braille in games is that white space gap between or else it just becomes too much. So it was something we kind of mentioned in our lobby earlier. Can a game have too much, too many bits, too much to touch that becomes confusing? Well, yes, it can. And uh, let's let's take a look at some examples okay. uh, from games we've played that uh, maybe aren't the best. We'll start with that, and when we'll we'll show off some of the nice ones later. All right. So the first one, Deanna has actually already called it out. Someone else. That's our editor, and she games. Thank you, Deanna, for all the work you do in the background. Um, she has brought up Thrones of Valeria. This is one of the trick taking card games that was in my head when we were when we were talking earlier. This is a game with very busy cards. The artwork is by the Miko. It's not even Miko's usual style. It's a line art. It's it's extremely well done and it's very neat. I get wanting to show that off, but it is very much at the expense of playability in a number of different ways. Um, for one, it is a trick-taking card game where the cards are not flippable. To me, that is a huge faux pas. Anyone that plays a trick-taking card game should be used to using standard bicycle-style playing cards, and they have a certain design for a reason, and people expect trick-taking games to feel like that. This does not. Then there are the choices in color, which make parts of the cards unreadable. That is followed up by deciding to make the games look dirty. And I think I'll let Sean talk about that part because it bothered him more than me. Yeah. Again, this is the first game I have ever found myself trying to wipe off cards because of graphical choices. Uh, yeah, it was that's... just a bizarre choice. And it not only uh, made uh, the, the visual, visual look muddy, uh, it, it muddied the graphics and the readability of everything. Uh, and while I understand the theme that they were going for, I, I get it. They wanted that dirty tavern feel. Unfortunately, it came at the expense of some levels of playability. Yeah, and there were some really odd choices. Like they tried to make the cards worn, but where they made them worn isn't actually where you hold the cards. So even if they were going for that thematic immersion of, oh, these are grimy cards that have been held by a thousand hands before you, they even failed at getting that across by making it illogical where the wear was on the cards. There were just so many choices in this game that I think could have been done better. To the fact that I think I would rather play the game with cards with no word. Like, just give me the iconography, because that's the other problem is the iconography on these cards is hidden in the top left corner and is almost as small as possible. And what people may not realize the brilliance of the bicycle cards is the suit is repeated in the in the card. It's not just in the corner. If there's eight, aces, eight of aces has eight hearts on it. eight of aces, eight of hearts has eight hearts on it not counting the corners and you get the number by counting them or by the number in the corner and the heart symbols there. And then there's a color like all of that was just thrown out to give you this totally new look where they decide all the information is down the left hand side and ooh, look at Miko's art. And it's a shame because frankly, we like Thrones of Valeria yep. as a trick taking card game. They have made some really interesting choices, some unique choices that make it a fun game. Yes. But it's hard to bring to the table because of some of the design choices. So unfortunately, as much as we are fans, it's probably not going to get played as much as it could if it had just been bright, clear card. Yeah. Like I can't see bringing that game to the barbershop bar. Well, I have, but like regularly because of the color choices. Yeah. That place, it's it's we're playing in a bar. It's it's not the best lit area. It's not my nice game room with lots of you know bright lights all over the place. And some of the card colors are just too hard to read, making the game literally unplayable. So next up, we've got another game, and now we are really, we swear, we're not <laughs> picking on Daily Magic games. Yeah, but we have played a lot of Valeria games recently, and that's the the reason why we're getting to Castellans of valeria here uh and to be fair also we have only played 
the prototype version of this. We yes. haven't seen the final version. Yeah, the big problem here is is it's similar to the Thrones of Valyria. Again, we have Miko's artwork, and I understand them wanting to show off Miko's artwork. And instead of highlighting the art, they put tiny iconography, which is in Zone 5, if I remember from earlier. It's not even on the game board. It's on a sidebar. So you are looking at the second from the box, like, like, or sorry, the rule book, like, like as far away as possible. These cards are at the extreme limit of your gameplay area and they have tiny icons on them and they are tiny detailed icons, not like big stars and triangles. You're talking a handout with a little die dropping into it with maybe an arrow on the bottom, which means one thing or an arrow on the top that means another. Yeah, these were really unfortunate. And to be fair, uh, my takeaway from our preview of the game was that citizen cards are a vital aspect of getting the most out of this game. And yet at the exact same time, we didn't use citizen cards to get the most out of the game because of the iconography. Players were actively avoiding using that aspect of the game, actively avoiding one of the main actions in the game that allows you to place citizens on the board and collect these cards to give you like great game breaking abilities that, that should be a huge part of the game because they couldn't bother to lean over and ask and look and see what it is. And then we get to zone six, because the other thing is there's no summary of these icons that was easily available. Now, from what I hear, that will be fixed. That was a prototype issue. But even then, it's in the rule book. It's not on a player reference card. It's not on the board. So it's it, in a way is two fails on that part. Now, in theory, if we had owned the game and been playing it regularly with the with the updated uh, guide sheet, we would probably mm -hmm. learn them and yes. get there. But we've played it a number of times. I've played it at least three or four times, and I couldn't tell you right now what those icons mean without looking. <laughs> <laughs> it's just I know, know some of them, but not yeah, all. But not enough of them to to be confident playing that game without having a reference sheet in front of me. Now, again, we're not picking on you, Daily Magic, but that game also had another problem, and that was they were really excited about this board that showed a district with a bunch of cities and putting tons of wooden pieces on it to make it look like the city's growing. And in a way, they nailed it, because that is one of my favorite aspects of this game, is how empty everything starts at the end of the game and how busy it looks at the, the, the end. And, and it works. It feels like you're building a city. So they nailed that part of it. But what they failed to do were to differentiate certain buildings or things you could build from others. Now, in general, this is great because in the game, every building's worth one point except for windmills. And windmills are in a spot that makes it very clear that they're worth half a point. And it would be fantastic if that was it. The problem is there are monuments you can build that score points every round and work differently from everything else. And while they gave you spots on the board to put them, they were kind of muddied and we didn't even notice one of them until our second game. And there was nothing to set it out once you put it. So you just, you're looking and you're like, yeah, there's a bunch of yellow there and blue and red. And obviously yellow has a majority and blue has this and red has this. So everyone gets these points. And then, you notice two rounds later, you're like, oh, wait, that was a windmill. For one, it didn't count towards area majority. So blue should have actually tied with red. And the other thing is that building could have been scoring every round and we forgot the last two rounds. So can I have my three points? Like it's, it's a mess. Yeah. Now we understand that there are, they, they are talking about changing uh, some of the graphics on those uh, pieces. But again, we will have to wait until, still, until uh, we, we see the final product to know just what kind of changes. Yeah, that one was pointed out by multiple reviewers. And from what I understand, they are working on a solution. So hopefully Daily Magic, by the time people start getting their copies of Castellans of Valeria from the very successful Kickstarter, it'll look even better. And we won't have any of these complaints. All right, well, next up is a game that we never really talked about for a long time. Well, <laughs> now we've got now we now we like it and now we've got to bring it down a little bit. Yeah, and that's Scythe. Now, most of Scythe is fantastic. I, I have very few complaints about Scythe. Uh, the double layer player boards are great. Talk about, you know, zone three and having all the information you need. Very readable. I the only thing I really need to know what other players are doing is where what action they're taking to see if I get the 
lieutenant bonus. And well, even that's done well with a nice chunky piece I can see from across the table. It all works great. That is until I lean over and look at the board and try to figure out what the different terrain types are. Jamie made the choice, or the artist, I'm assuming Jamie, made the choice to make the map look realistic, right? It, you, you, it, It's hexagon-based, but things kind of overlap a bit. And by being this po- post-apocalyptic wasteland look, it all kind of blends together. It all looks very brown and red. Now, you need to know what each terrain type is for various reasons. Um, one, to figure out what resources they produce. If you're going to get extra characters, if there's a tunnel presence that lets you move around the board, all of that's important information. And what they did, they did make artistically each look different, but I find they all blend together. They did give you icons, but these icons are the smallest things on the board. They, they are one-tenth, maybe the size of the hexes. And in this case, for game playability, I would have preferred the whole hex was that symbol. I don't need the farm to look like a farm with fields on it. I just need to see the symbol that means if I sit there and I have a worker there, I get grain. That's what I need to know. This was an unfortunate thing because, again, this game has done so many things fantastically well. Uh, And even overall, the board looks great. Yeah. Except they have taken this one rather important piece of information and shrunk it down to a ridiculously small size compared to how important that information is yes. for the players. And that's unfortunate. Yeah, because even not even just generating resources, there's also the most complicated part of the game. The part that trips up every player who's ever played Scythe is the way River Walk works. Now, in the game, at the start of the game, you can't get across rivers. You're, you're kind of stuck in one small area. That is until you bring caves or you unlock the river walk ability. And the river walk ability lets you move into specific types of terrain. And everyone messes this up. They even give you, here, here's them, Jamie, trying to do it right, giving you a level one card, a card you can pick up and look at to show you where you can river walk into. But that doesn't help when I can't tell what the tiles are on the board. When when you add complexity to an already complex mechanic, that is a problematic design. And again, it became a, a it, it is is in the end a graphical choice, yes, uh, to have made that a little bit more difficult to understand. Now, what I don't know is if this improves because I know later Scythe eventually released um, random map tiles and stuff like that. And perhaps even on the neoprene map version of the board, it might be more clear than it is now. I I can't talk to that. All I own is the original game and a couple of expansions that don't affect this either way. Well, next up, we've got one where the artwork was kind of locked in from the beginning. (laughs) You were pretty much going to get the artwork you got no matter what. When you got My Little Pony's Adventures, Adventures in Equestria, the deck building game. Yeah, this one makes sense, right? The game's based on a cartoon. So, of course, it has cartoon-style artwork. And to be even more thematic, they actually got one of the IDW comic books artists from My Little Pony to do all the artwork in this game. And I got to say, as far as a, oh, look, at it's a My Little Pony game with pretty My Little Pony art, it wins. It's exactly what you'd expect, and it's exactly what I would want out of a My Little Pony-looking game. They even even have little you know standees and the standees work like it looks great but there are some serious usability issues in this game and again we have gotten to sort of the same issue that we were talking about earlier where yes the art is important i mean the art is very important it's my little pony um my little pony is a is a a look more than anything mm-hmm. else um you know it started as as little little dolls that you know have a had a specific style and look to them and so while you can't compromise that look, they went sort of too far in the other direction by minimizing iconography in order to ensure that no detriment was ever made to the look of the ponies. And that mm-hmm. makes the game a little harder to play. Yeah, And it, this is another one of those cho- choices of color and contrast. So one of the things they did right is they put all of the resources you get from a card in the same spot all the time. So if you get friendship, it's always in this same spot of the card. If you're getting movement, it's always in the same spot of the card. The big problem is on one of the basic cards, the generic movement card that everyone gets, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the card offhand. They happen to put the movement symbol, which is a black arrow over a very dark tree. 
and the two blend together. This one so much so that almost every time I teach the game, someone will hand me that card and say, what's this card do? Because they don't see the icon. Yeah, it literally blends in so wonderfully well, I suppose. It's <laughs> it's this chameleon-like symbol that isn't, I mean, it's, it's not a, 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 a bad symbol. It, the symbol itself actually makes yeah. sense. It's good iconography, but because of the order in which thing the I have to assume it's the order in which you know card art and iconography and things were all designed that it ended up in this place that with the art that had been chosen for that card probably well in advance it it blended into the background you've got this chameleon yeah. icon that uh, is very problematic Oh, I'll admit it's one of those things. Once you know it's there, you can't help but see it and it's fine. But it's just how many people, the number of people have been ask me, what's this card do? And I'm like, oh, and it's not like the bottom of the card. You know how Terraforming Mars, one thing that Terraforming Mars did really well is every card explains exactly what it does, even if it's extremely clear what the card does. That's not here. There's no, you know, generates two movement and which if they had that, that would have fixed the issue in a way. Now, this game does have another problem, which gets back into the zones of play problem, and that is extremely small iconography on some of the other cards in the game. Not not the cards you're going to hold in your hand, specifically the yeah, the location cards and also some of the um, the trouble cards, the, the things you're trying to overcome. But worst is on on the location cards. And that is with, again, the the basic resource symbols. And in particular, the help symbol. The help symbol is a horseshoe with a number in it. This has shrunk down so small. Like, I don't know what point font it is, but it's like eight or six or something uh, on these uh, cards. Four, three or four, I think, is probably yeah. the, the actual answer. Again, you've got, because uh, I believe it, I believe I recall it's in a circle. So it's a circle with a horseshoe with a number. And the entire, the entire icon is less than the side the 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 diameter of a pencil eraser yeah it's oh it's, it's way smaller than that <laughs> and it, so it's smaller diameter than the capital letters and the sentences it's in yeah like and 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 it just it becomes uh you know for someone with vision difficulty it's impossible for someone with good eyes it's still difficult like to be fair at zone one i have a hard time in my dominant hand in front of my face I, I can't read some of these. My kids have a hard time reading them across the table and they have way better eyes than I do. So it's not just my age in this. Yeah. And there's no, and there's no differentiation uh, in color or any graphic between, you know, six and eight inside yep. the horseshoe. It's exactly the same. Uh, and it's the same color as the text around it, I believe. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like a font. Like if they were taping, they, they, they have like a five horseshoe key on their keyboard. Like it just, you know, it's in there. And, and I find that extremely frustrating. And that's one where, like, until you've memorized the cards, you're constantly going to be, okay, now I do know they tend to be either, I forget now, say five or eight. And I'm like, okay, is that a five one or an eight one? And and I've learned that I can at least differentiate that it's one of the two. But it's almost <laughs> but like taking it. a Sharpie and drawing a big five over top of this yeah. tiny little uh, icon because the icon is useless. Now, interestingly, this I don't think is as much art-based. This is just they pack too much information on one small card. Yeah. So it's it, this is more of a graphic design issue than a yeah the the it, art's too nice and the thematic yeah, the movement is, the movement resource card is definitely an art issue. That's an art issue. But this yeah the the iconography is, is something. Else. And to be fair, the movement one isn't the only one. There are lots of cards where where it's a little more difficult than I'd like. And the resources blend in with the art more than I would like. All right. The last example I am going to pull up is Aldabas, Doors of Cartagena. Now, it's a game about big doors with huge knockers. So I get that the art and card design would focus on the doors and their knockers. But that's some of the least useful information while playing the game. The door color in particular is the thing you notice first when looking at one of these cards. This only matters for one simple placing rule that you can't put two doors of the same color next to each other. That's the only reason the color matters, and it is the most prominent thing on the card. Now, now next is the knockers. The knockers stick out more. Now, those matter, sort of, because they indicate the suit of the card. 
But the thing is, the art's based on a real life thing. So I get it. You want it to look as similar as possible. And cards in the same suit all say have fish on them. But the various fish, it's like, is that one fish? Is that two fish? The fish that are both facing both ways, is that a two fish? I can't even tell. So that is almost useless to anyone playing the game. And instead, you're going to look to the icons in the top left of the card. But those are tiny. And it just, there just has to be a better way to get the information that's important. Like the card design looks great and you don't even know it's a problem until you start playing and realize what I need to know is hard to find. Yeah. Again, these are beautiful and they are representing the real life doors of Cartagena. Uh, the, you know, this is a real thing. This is a tourist destination and the people of called, uh, of uh, Cartagena are proud of this heritage of door knockers and the levels of respect that certain door knockers and styles and, you know, the more fancy it is, the more uh, powerful that person is. Mm -hmm. And it represents what guild they belong to. And I get it. That's very important. And it is important to respect the heritage and mm -hmm. the history behind that. But at the same time, this is a game. Yeah. And, in order to play the game, you need certain pieces of information and trying to decipher the code of door knockers is not how you get that information. Yeah. So that's our, that's our five examples of a problematic artwork in games that maybe may in fact have been able to have been done better, but we want to lend this on a positive note. So why don't we find three examples of great integration of art and playability? So the first one I want to call out is Boop because it should be too much. You are taking a basic abstract strategy game that I could play on the beach with a stick where I can draw some lines and some colored stones and turning it into a game where you take the game box and flip it over. Then you put a quilted board on top of it to form the playing area. Then you are handed six cat meeples or sorry kitten meeples that are super cute bent over with their tails in the air and then you also have eight cat meeples which are much chunkier with their pointy ears sitting upwards then you have to differentiate the two teams so one is orange calico cats and the other are gray cats and we silk screen them all so that the cats actually look unique between the teams beside their colors so just in case Perhaps someone has a difficulty seeing orange and gray. You can tell the difference by their stripes and their belly colors. It is so over the top and ridiculous, but it all works. None of this gets in the way of the game at all. You have these over the top pieces and, and seriously, one of the silliest game boards ever. It's an upside down box with a quilted board put on top of it. So it looks like a bed. But it all works. There is there is no impact to the no negative impact to the gameplay at all, but a huge positive impact for the theme of the game of cats jumping onto a bed and booping each other and trying to get a row of cats and lined up to be able to win the game. And on top of theme, you get accessibility. Uh, yeah. So you've got that as well. And and one of the things that I when I when I first looked at it, my first thought was, oh, you know what, with this quilt. You know, is it going to be is it going to be problematic? Is, is are things going to tip over? Are things going to not be lined up? It's not a problem at all. Uh, for no. whatever reason, despite the fact that they could have just made a bunch of squares on the back of the box, yeah. they went to this next level and it just works. And, and it's not at all problematic. None of the concerns I had when I looked at uh, a product like that and, and the potential concerns that sort of leapt into my mind looking at it, none of them came to pass. Uh, it was really easy to play on. Things weren't falling over. You, things it wasn't hard to get it into a into you know right in right into the square where you needed it. Yep. it, it all just made sense and worked. And yet, it's yeah. a very artistically designed game. And it's awesome because the designer did not design it like this. This was all done by smirk and laughter. Clay took the game, and and gave it this theme. And that's why it won Game of the Year at the uh, the Origins Award. Well, not Game of the Year. It was it was the the fan choice, the Gamma fan choice of the year because of this theme. Like everyone was talking about this game while we were at Origins. It is just so 
Like you, you can't help it. It's a game about booping cats off a of bed, <laughs> and it looks like you have little cats, and you're even you're gonna. And there's a bed for them to bounce on. Like it's just like I said, it should be in the list of over the top. This is ridiculous. Why did they do all this? I could play this with a piece of paper and some coins. Like if someone had dime, dimes and nickels on one side and Canadian on the other, you could play this game. But it works. I, I, I had to include this in a great example because I, I swear it's like it's on the limit. Like if they had made every kitten unique, it might have just been that part that just a little too much. Yep. Nope. They did a fantastic job. And that was Boop by Smirk and Dagger. Next up, we've got Azul. Like we haven't talked about this one a few times. Yeah, this is just an absolutely beautiful game. I It just the thing is, it fits the theme so well. This is a board game about placing individual tiles in a pattern on a wall to make a, pa- a a specific pattern that's that's known for it in a region of Portugal. It's a, it's a Portuguese style thing. And what they give you are tiles. Now, no, they're not ceramic tiles that you would put on an actual wall. Instead, they're plastic, but they're that shape, they're that size, they're that texture that it feels like you are manipulating tiles. And then you are putting them on a wall. The difference is the wall's flat. It's in whatever zone three, your tableau, and you're placing pieces down onto a wall. I, I, there, there's a bit of a weird theme with the factories and grabbing tiles, but just the components feel so good. They sound so good clacking together in the bag when you shift them up. Like the only complaint I can actually see artistically and, and usability with Azul is the fact the playboards are flat and things can slide around. Now, I never had a problem with that with the actual tiles, but the score marker is pretty easily bumped. But the designers must have realized this because they put out an expansion called Crystal Mosaic, and now everything even stays in its place, and it even gives a kind of lacquered look to the wall. Yeah, and on top of it, they didn't minimize, minimize the design. I mean, there is fantastic art over the factories and everything out there, Mm. but it is low enough. uh, It is, uh, you know, subdued enough that it doesn't distract from the tiles that are on top because the tiles that are sitting on top of the factories or sitting on top of your board are really all that matter. Mm. Everything else is window dressing and they treated it that way. They could have easily made it bright and pretty and, and gorgeous, but it would have distracted and they very deliberately took those levels down so that they were there. They were pretty, but they do not distract from the only thing in the game that matters, which is the tiles. Yeah, the tiles and where you place them. Now, they did extra steps, of course, by adding patterns to some of the tiles, um, which look great. But added bonus for accessibility, that was actually done for color blindness issues so that you can easily tell similar looking colors under different types of color blindness apart. And I'm like, man, that's like next level. Like, like that's that's taking like you're being more artistic while making the game more playable. Like, can you do a better job? All right. So let's last one. Last one. Our last uh, call out for good design would be Vinhos Deluxe. I wanted to bring this one up because Preda Porter is is a Vitalis Erta game with artwork by Eno Tool. So I wanted to find a game that's on the opposite end of the spectrum, one that I think nails being able to impart a ton of information, a Vital Lacerda amount of board game knowledge on a board and player boards without going over the top, without going too far. Yes, it's a busy board. There are a lot of different things on that board, but it's a busy game. It's a heavy Euro with a lot of different things going on, going on. But what Ian was able to do with this one was break up the board using things like white space and artwork to break up the mechanical parts of the board where you're placing or taking things, as well as showing you the flow of the game using that left to right, up to down thing I was talking about before. You start the game having to purchase vineyards. Well, the first thing in the top left is your map of the region. Uh, Is this also Portugal? I think it might be. I can't remember now where the Rhine region is in Vinho. Sorry, bad mo. Um, But that's the first thing you're going to do is do that. And then 
Yes, you've got sure. the, the next phase of the game. And while there's a whole other half of the game where you're going to wine shows, wine, wine cons and showing off your wine. Well, that's on the other half of the board. So it's like, here's one part of the game. Here's the other part of the game, clearly differentiated. And right there, smack dab in the middle of the board, the clearest thing, the brightest thing, it's white separated from everything else is the worker placement grid, which everyone is going to interact with every turn. Like it just, it, it it's a, it's a lesson in fantastic art integration with game mechanics and iconography. Like I, I can't think of anything wrong with this game. And then there's added artistic touches. Like the player reference cards look like wine menus, little things like that. Now mechanically or, or, or what, like for imparting information, they're perfect. There's lots of white space. The text is large enough. The iconography is clear. But the fact they made them a threefold with a cover just brings that to that next level. And this is one where there was a distinct difference. There's a reason that we are talking about Vinhouse Deluxe. Yes. Because the original Vinhouse that wasn't designed by Ian O'Toole, while beautiful, was distracting. It was mm -hmm. over the top. There was too much design art art artistic design which interfered with the iconography and the readability of it and what you notice if you do a side-by-side -side view between the two boards informationally they're more or less the same there isn't all that much difference gameplay wise between the boards but what ian has done has been to again reduce the sort of the level, turn down the volume, as Roger may, you know, mentioned in his question, turn yeah. down the volume on some of that artistic design, uh, use more muted colors, which allows the information, the gameplay to pop out off of the board while yep. still leaving a lot of the designs. And yes, it is Portugal uh, of that That's Portuguese so. wine region and, and the Portuguese feel of the game to still exist. But again, down a little bit lower where it's not interfering with what matters to a board game player. Yep. Well, that is it for our talk on board game aesthetics, how some games take things a bit too far. What does board game art, when does art, board game art become a bit too much for you? Let us know about it in the comments below or fire off an email to mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Now, if you've got a question for us, just hit us up with an email, this time to questions at tabletopbellhop.com so it doesn't get lost in the inbox, or head over to the blog and click on Ask the Bellhop. 